The Best Minds Podcast with Jeff and Deborah J creates a space for families and the best thinkers in the addiction field to come together. Our goal is to broaden thinking and know how to help make recovery a reality in families across America. John Curtis is co founder and CEO of The Retreat in Wyzetta, Minnesota. He is one of the principal designers of the Retreat Model, a 12 step immersion program. Prior to his employment with the retreat, John worked for the Hazelden Foundation for over 19 years. In his years at Hazelden, John served as vice president of Hazelden's National Continuum, executive director of Hazelden's Outreach Services, executive director of Fellowship Club, Hazelden's Intermediate Care Facility in St. Paul, Minnesota, unit supervisor of two of Hazelden's primary treatment units, and as a chemical dependency counselor. We've known John personally for more than 20 years, having met him in the company of Dr. George Mann, another co-founder of The Retreat. When we first met, The Retreat had not yet opened, but it held great promise as a spiritual touchstone for modern treatment. That promise has now been fulfilled in no small measure because of John's tireless efforts. I'd like to welcome our esteemed guest and dear friend, John Curtis, to the Best Minds podcast. Well, thank you, Jeff. Great to be here, Deborah. It's an honor and privilege. It's so good to have you, John. We're very excited to talk about the retreat and the idea of 12-step immersion. You know, I remember way back when it was you know, it was just a conversation. It was a very interesting conversation. And so I would like you to start out and tell us a little bit about why you and George Mann decided to develop this 12-step immersion program. When you did, you know, it's, it was interesting timing because you really diverged from the usual treatment model that most people are accustomed to and decided to do something very different. So if you could talk us Talk to us a little bit about the history, but also what were you trying to solve with this model? Well, that's a, a good question. And uh, it really started back in 1991. Johnson Institute put together a, a think tank down in Captiva Island, Florida. They invited 50 professionals from across the country to get together representing chemical dependency, uh, uh, criminal justice, research. And the theme was, where are alcoholics going to get help in the future? So this is in 91, when we were beginning to see the very early stages of managed care coming in and starting to manage the access points to residential treatment across the country. They particularly focused on California and Minnesota. And the idea was they they thought they were going to lower the cost of of uh, their annual cost of care by, you know, making it more difficult to get into residential treatment. Uh, and of course, we saw that that uh, this was going to end up uh, being a, a real problem in the addiction world. And I had known George Mann. Dr. Mann was the founder of St. Mary's uh, Treatment Center in Minneapolis, one of the first 12-step hospital-based programs in Minnesota and maybe in the country. I'd known of him, but I'd never really sat and talked to him. So we met in Captiva, and I represented Hazelden at the meeting. Uh, George and I sat and and just had a real heartfelt conversation about uh, where the addiction treatment field was going. And we were both frustrated with just the uh, ever-increasing complexity of treatment due to licensure and certification, accreditation, um, you know, the cost of care was beginning to skyrocket and access to care was diminishing. And we were beginning to see outcomes diminishing. And George was so frustrated that he was, uh, he said, I'm retiring. I'm like done with this. George really decided to, uh, when we came back to the Twin Cities, he said, well, let's continue this dialogue. He formed a group called the Community of Recovering People. And it existed of uh, professionals. Uh, There were, you know, myself and, you know, I had a master's degree in healthcare administration and George was a physician and we had medical directors from a couple other treatment programs. 
and longtime recovered uh, men and women from the community, business leaders. And uh, we met at the Basilica of St. Mary's in Minneapolis once a month to just explore different treatment options. And we brought in researchers from the East Coast, and we brought in uh, social model movement people from California, and we talked to people that, that were the originators of High Watch Farm, the the recovery retreat, really, that Bill W. and Marty Mann started in 1939 in Kent, Connecticut. Of course, I one of my jobs at Hazelden was teaching the Minnesota model, which was the history of Hazelden. And so we had a lot of experience with just kind of what it was like in the early days, 1949 and 50, when Hazelden started. And so we we met once a month at the Basilica for seven years. <laughs> so it was a long, uh, time-consuming, uh, at times frustrating process. Um, but eventually we got to the point where, okay, let's do something. Uh, we've, we've now identified that the problem is that with all the treatment there is in America, uh, only 10% of the people who need help are getting it. 90% of the people out there in our country who need help from alcoholism or drug dependency are not getting it. Mostly, probably 50%, according to SAMHSA, uh, is because they can't afford the cost of care. So we said, well, let's let's come up with a model that is affordable, um, that is simple, that is spiritual in nature, And that was the other trend we were seeing in treatment, that as the complexity started to increase and as the pressure for managed care continued to grow, and managed care said, look, we're not going to pay to have a patient find God and do an inventory, but we will pay to address co occurring conditions. So, so much of the treatment world, not just in Hazelden, but across the country, started putting so much energy into the biopsychosocial assessment process, which, by the way, is the most expensive part of treatment, and less attention in teaching the basic principles of recovery embodied in the 12 steps, spirituality of AA. And um, so we said, well, let's, let's take a look at the, the, the very best that we know about treatment you know, when you look at all the patient responses uh, after they've left a 30-day treatment program, uh, you know, they never talk about, you know, the quality of their treatment plan uh, or the quality of the administrative services that surround them. Uh, They basically talk about the quality of the coffee table interaction that they had with other patients, other guests. And And so we knew that there was something, there was a powerful dynamic that happened when you brought people together uh, that had a a common problem and focus on a common solution. uh, There was a power that happened uh, in community. And we said, well, let's, let's use that as the core. The other thing that we did is we brought 50 people together from the community that had 10 years or more of sobriety. And we said, you know, and we had, we brought them together for a lunch and, and we asked a series of questions. And, you know, the one question was, how did you do it? How did you get 10 years of, of continuous sobriety? And then we write down all their answers. And, and the, the most common was that, uh, I stayed active in Alcoholics Anonymous, or NA. Um, I had great friends. All my friends were active in recovery. I had a good sponsor, and I did service work. So we said, well, let's, let's begin to develop a curriculum around teaching that type of solution so that instead of focusing so much in this model that we were looking at developing, so much on the problem identification, let's put our focus on the solution. And how do you find joy in recovery in in a long-term way? 
1995, I wrote a business plan. And about two in the morning, I was trying to come up with a name. And I, I, I said, well, for now, I'm just going to put in the retreat uh, because I wanted to really say what it was. It, it was. It's interesting that all of us in this group were healthcare professionals, mo- or many of us. And we found that the answer to the problem was taking it out of the healthcare system and driving the treatment of addiction back into the community. So uh, we developed uh, the the business plan, called it the retreat. And then for the next uh, couple of years, we all rallied together around, uh, let's, let's, let's develop a 20 bed experiment to see if we could create a model of care that could produce the same or better outcomes at a fraction of the cost. Because if we're going to start to address the the issue that we're facing in our country, we're going to have to drive the cost of care significantly down and to obviously improve access to care. So in 1998, uh, we found a building, uh, the old Pillsbury Gale family home just west of Minneapolis called Upland Farm. Um, a beautiful 8,000 square foot brick mansion, 172 acres of land and some outbuildings and a horse stable. And it was just a gorgeous property. And we said, this is perfect. And so one of our board members purchased the land and the property and he leased it to us. He said, we'll give it to you for three years and uh, with an option to buy. And if it's a success, then great. And if not, then I'll take it back and and uh, build something else out of it. So in in April of 1998, well, just a, a few months before that, George Mann approached me and said, "John, do you believe in this model enough to leave your cushy job at Hazelton to to run it?" And I had to do a little praying about it, but not much uh, because I certainly did believe that this was the right thing to do. But it was one of those, uh, you know, jumping off a cliff moves in your life, uh, the space between the trapeze where you're kind of flailing about and praying that, you know, something's going to show up here. And uh, anyway, in April uh, 98, I left Hazelden and uh, drove my car to the the new location over in uh, Minnetrista, Minnesota. Uh, And here I was all alone in an empty building with no furniture. And I'm looking around, I'm going, wait, at at Hazelden, I had people. Now I have no people. I'm all by myself. (laughs) What have I done? (laughs) But, you know, people started showing up and, uh, there was an energy around, you know, creating something new that was based on something time tested and old in many ways. Looking back at the earliest days of, of one alcoholic helping another. So that was really the beginning of the retreat. You know, I just love what you say about focusing on the solution, teaching people how to engage in the solution. It's so important. And, you know, I think about those early days, John, and I'm thinking about conversations we had when the thinking was that this 12-step immersion program would probably primarily benefit people who first went through a traditional treatment program and then relapsed. But over time, and you can tell me if, you know, you can talk about this and correct me if I'm wrong, but really understanding that this 12-step immersion program worked well for a much larger population seeking treatment, not just the person who relapsed. Could you talk to us a little bit about that, how that's played out over, well, what are you, 21 years in now? Actually, we just had our 22nd year anniversary on January 20, or June 21st. So, Congratulations, 22 Fantastic. years. 22 years, and we've had 26,000 people go through from around the world. Uh, so, yeah, we uh, first we've grown from uh, a 19, 20-bed experiment to now with 169 beds and, uh, and uh, lots of different programs, and we're now located in Wyzetta, the Wyzetta Big Woods. But you're right that uh, in the beginning, I think that, everyone thought the retreat would be best suited for people who 
had had a previous treatment experience, meaning they've they've already kind of learned about alcoholism and addiction 101, and they they understand the disease concept and and powerlessness and all of that, and and uh, and still to this day, probably 80 percent of our people have been to one to five previous treatments, but that 20 percent of people who have never been to treatment. That was the the probably the uh, and for us that are were developing this, we kind of felt that it would be appropriate for a broad spectrum of people who who uh, uh, throughout the continuum. I think the treatment world liked to look at the retreat as more of a continuing care option, and partly because it was a it was a, a bit threatening, I think, to the treatment community that. Uh, that we could create a model of care that could produce the same or better outcomes for a fraction of the cost. That was, you know, considered, uh, you know, pretty radical at that time. And nobody was really moving in the direction of more uh, of, of simpler and more basic. Everybody was moving into just adding more bells and whistles and oceanside views with 1200 count bed sheets and massage therapists and aquine therapy. And, and, uh, every time you went to a marketing conference, there was a different, uh, you know, somebody had some other shiny penny to bring to the, the, the field. And we said, no, what we want to do is create something that is just basic and teaching people what, what it looks like to surrender to the power of this illness and to engage in in the help of others and you know become humble and teachable and and so well we found that model uh worked uh, actually better for the the first timers than it did for the chronic repeaters um which uh was a bit of a surprise to us i think in the beginning we had two researchers uh, out in oregon that had a research company that measured everything that we did. Uh, and for about 16 years, we had them, you know, question patients or guests when they come in, when they leave and six months and 12 months out. Uh, and the outcomes were actually better for the first timers. And, you know, but they came in knowing that they had the problem and they were motivated for change. Often, uh, their father was a 20-year sober guy in AA or some other family member was in recovery and the family was just waiting for Johnny to get ready. You know, they, they came in with, a you know, an open mind and an open heart. And, and we gave them the basic information about this is what you need to do to learn to be happy and sober. That's great. That's great. Can you talk a little bit about how a 12-step immersion program actually works? Yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, the primary uh, and one of the radical uh, differences, I think, between uh, the retreat model and most other treatments is the direct agent of change in our model is really God working through community rather than the agent of change being between the therapist and or the counselor and the patient it's the relationship between the guests and this community of people who are alive with the spirit of recovery. So when we started, we had a handful of volunteers from the community that were, you know, front row members of the 12 step community, NAAA, you know, really solid orientation to the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, which really are the set of instructions on how to stay sober. Um, they were very active in service. So uh, that volunteer base has grown to now we have 400 volunteers that come in and out of the retreat every month. That's amazing, John. 400. It, it, it's, it's amazing to all of us. And so when you come into the retreat, um, with an open mind and an open heart, ready to, you know, learn about recovery, you're surrounded with these bright light people who are front row members of, 
uh, recovery in the community. So I think that the greatest gift that we have experienced in this model is the gift that these volunteers give to our guests. And so they come in and they they teach the big book. They go through steps uh, one through eight while they're here as a guest at the retreat. It's uh, on average a 30-day stay. So while they're here for 30 days, they complete steps one through eight so that uh, they're ready to begin to make amends when they're, when they, when they leave here. And, you know, we go through the process uh, basically one step at a time. And so they have uh, worksheets that they complete. Uh, So there's a big book study that happens three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday in the morning. And that's done by an outside volunteer and, and particularly gifted volunteers who really are gifted at making the book come alive and able to articulate kind of the nuanced language and uh, to help people to understand what the the founders of AA really meant by taking the steps. And then after they have that class, they complete their, their worksheets so that they begin to internalize and write down, uh, what does powerless mean to me in my life? How have I experienced that in my life? What's my relationship with a higher power? Um, you know, taking a personal inventory, preparing for a fifth step, beginning to put your, your list together of, of, uh, assets and liabilities and, and defects of character that, that block you from, from being happy in recovery. So there's a whole series of things that they do. And then they share after they've written that down, they meet in small groups with each other and share the information. Uh, So they're getting it taught to them by an instructor, volunteer. They write down their own personal connection with those steps, and then they share those connections with the members of the peer group so that they're then ready to move on to the next step. So there's this circular learning model that's going on all the time at the retreat. You know, it's interesting you should say that, John, because as you're talking, I'm thinking about the experience of the new person coming to the retreat and what do they see all of these senior peers working on these steps, this serious but wonderful and fun process of actually working a program of recovery. I mean, that has to be an amazing experience for someone coming in who's new, you know, setting up that kind of really positive social norm. Yeah, it's it's attractive, and it's uh, and it's it once once you kind of walk into the situation like that, you want to be part of that. You know, you want to say, "Look, everyone around me uh, are positively looking at what they can do to improve the quality of their life in recovery," and I want to get on that bus. I want to be a part of it, and. Uh, so it's an attractive, you know, it is a program of attraction. So we try to create a, an attractive environment, uh, for people to come in and have the experience of recovery. This is not something, it it isn't more education that people need. In fact, the people who come to the retreat are smart. They're motivated. They know all the words. They can't hear the music, but they know the words. Many of them can recite the big book forward and backward. So, you know, this is all about teaching people how to find the joy in recovery. And, you know, I just want to say one other thing because you're using these words that make me think, you know, I've done some work with the founder of the Behavior Change Lab at Stanford. And um, when you start looking at what creates lasting change, well, one is simplicity. Keep it really simple. The more complex you make it, the less likely you're going to create lasting change. Number two is a positive social norm, just what you're talking about, creating something positive that somebody's going to be attracted to. Because if you create something negative, they're going to be attracted to that. That's so important. The simplicity and that attraction are both what they look at for creating lasting change. Those are two of the things. 
And things that don't create lasting change are important, but don't create lasting change are two other words you used, motivation and education. They have their place for a short-term boost, but it's interesting how you've gotten this formula really is absolutely in line with what Stanford says creates lasting change and what doesn't. Well, and frankly, we just kind of made it up as we went along. So it just happened that we lined up with Stanford. I'm happy about that. Well, you did it. You did it brilliantly. (laughs) But it's exciting to watch and it's a very nurturing environment. And I think that that's uh, the, the comment we get from almost every guest who leaves is that they were surrounded by love and people who believed in them. And we can look back, you know, I've been in this now and you you all have been in this a long time as well, but, you know, 40, 42 years in this business. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, the people who do the best in recovery, who, who, who put together longevity in recovery are people who have people in their lives who believe in them. And, uh, you know, we can all point to, you know, a couple people in our life who who believed in us when we couldn't believe in ourselves. And there's a power in that relationship that is, uh, you know, there are days when you stay sober just because you don't want to disappoint this special friend in your life who believes in you. We kind of built this whole community around creating those kind of connections with people so that, uh, you know, my experience previous in treatment and the treatment world is that you're kind of in this isolated bubble where you present all kinds of information and you identify lots of, lots of uh, issues that need to be addressed, co-occurring issues and, and different treatment strategies for all of them. And at the very end of it, you give them a, a name on a piece of paper and say, call Joe and, and uh, see if he can bring you to some meetings. And, uh, you know, the person leaves and calls Joe and Joe says, well, I haven't been to a meeting in three months, but come on, we'll go anyway. And we were very intentional about creating those kind of relationships right away when a person gets to the retreat. So they begin to know these people that are going to end up being their friends, their mentors, their guides long after they're out. That makes so much sense. And let me ask you, how do you determine Who is appropriate for a 12-step immersion program like the retreat and and who is not? Well, we have a a screening uh, process that we go through. Uh, Somebody calls and there's a pre-registration screening tool that we use with them on the phone. It's generally about a half an hour, 20-minute phone conversation. And it's in some ways a mini biopsychosocial assessment. Uh, where we we look at their their chemical use history, uh, we look at their previous treatment history, criminal justice background, uh, medication history, psychological history, so that we can really kind of determine that the person meets our criteria, which basically is that you know that you have the problem of addiction, that you're motivated for change. And if you have a co-occurring condition, it's not the primary burning house issue. Half of our people that come to the retreat have a co-occurring condition, maybe as high as 60%. And it's mostly depression, anxiety, um, and they're on antidepressant medications or they're seeing a therapist or a psychiatrist. So uh, right now in their life, the burning house issue is the, the addiction in their life that person would be appropriate for a setting like the retreat. If a person calls us and says, you know, I'm not sure what my problem is. I don't know if I even want to recover. And I'm thinking of killing myself every other day. You know, I I think I'm depressed. I'm not sure. Well, you need treatment. You need a clinical uh, treatment experience where you get the full biopsychosocial and multidisciplinary treatment experience. And I would say 20% of the people who call the retreat are referred to a higher level of care uh, because we feel they, they're they just not quite ready for this supportive educational approach. They need something more clinical and medical. And of course, then everybody has to be medically stable when they get here. So 
if somebody needs to be detox first, they, they have to, and we have local detox centers around the retreat that people can go to and get stabilized. If there are other complications that drive them to a higher level of care, uh, we make sure they, they get there before coming here. And then once a person arrives, uh, we go through those questions again upon admission, because what we've learned over time is that alcoholics and addicts will tell you just about anything on the phone to get in the door. And then you see them (laughs) face to face and you realize, whoa, there's a lot more going on here uh, or not. And, uh, and then we, we watch very closely how people interact and uh, adjust to the environment, particularly that first week that they're here. So if somebody does get in that turns out they need a higher level of care, then we're able to, you know, make sure they get to that appropriate setting. That's great. You know, I, um, I, you know, over time, You've also, you know, kind of in the same vein that you have built this program to include um, some programming for very specific people. Could you give us an overview of some of your um, specific programming? Well, first, when we started, we were co-ed, frankly, because while we were a 20-bed unit and and it was kind of hard to not be a co-ed setting initially. Uh, but as we grew, we realized that, uh, you know, we really need to uh, create a, a unique environment for women and men separately. Actually, prior to that, we realized in our second year of operation that a lot of people needed more time than 30 days at the retreat. And so we found a house on Summit Avenue in St. Paul, which is the old historic area of St. Paul, actually a block away from the governor's mansion. And a friend of mine was uh, at a Starbucks coffee shop and we were talking one morning and I said, I said, I want to open up a sober house. He goes, well, I've got a house right here on Summit Avenue. And uh, and I said, well, you ought to, you ought to sell it to me. And uh, about a week later, he called me back and said, you know what, I'm thinking about doing that. And, and you know, within a week, we purchased the house, and opened up our first sober house. And that was a chance to allow people to go from the retreat into a, a sober practice ground where they could go live for, you know, six months to a year and practice putting the principles into their feet out there in the real world. Uh, and that was the beginning of our sober house model. Uh, and we now have six houses, 78 beds, uh, all along Summit Avenue, which of all places, you know, most people, when you're setting up sober houses, say, well, you probably put that over in the east side of St. Paul or North Minneapolis and, and say, well, I want to know, where do you live? Well, I live on Summit Avenue. I said, OK, that's where I want to be. Uh, you know, <laughs> it's, uh, I want I want the people we serve to live like you live, like I live, like we live. And um, so anyway, that's been an amazing addition to what we do and it probably has contributed as much as anything to our our outcomes um, when we moved to Wyzetta so we were in our initial location for about six and a half years and we'd outgrown it we had a long waiting list we needed more property and a spiritual retreat center that was nestled in the middle of the Wyzetta big woods uh, was in the process. The nuns had moved out and, and a group of developers wanted to come in and build 187 apartment units. And the community of Wyzetta, which is a little 4,000 person community, this is kind of where the Pillsbury's and the General Mills families and live. And it's a very intimate little community in, in outside of Minneapolis, uh, said, no, we want to preserve the spiritual integrity of that property. And we don't want to lose the big woods, 22 acres of old growth forest. So I wrote a letter to the city council and I said, we're a little nonprofit. We'll keep it a spiritual retreat center for alcoholics and addicts. uh, And we'll help preserve the woods. And the mayor came to me later and said, if you can convince the citizens of Wyzetta to raise their property taxes, 3.1 million and you come up with the other three and a half million, then you can buy the property. And uh, 
We had 19 community meetings in people's homes around Wyzetta, and it took, uh, you know, close to a year to to get it to finally work. And it was uh, brokered by the Trust for Public Land in Minnesota. And uh, it was a f- amazing public-private partnership. So in this particular case, it was developers or alcoholics. And the alcoholics won out, <laughs> which is such a rare thing. <laughs> that almost never happens, John. I mean, it's and, – and, and of course, you know, you're talking about probably the most well-to-do community in the state of Minnesota – and uh, it says a lot to what you're doing that the community ended up supporting you. In just this amazing. It's, uh, it was just, uh, you know, we all were shaking our head and praying and, and saying thank you a lot because it, it was just amazing to watch. But once we got here in 2003, we renovated it and brought it up to the, the, the level that we felt the, the property needed to be and then moved all the guests over here in 2004, right. September. Then we decided, okay, let's let's do a full blown uh, residential family program for family members, not just family members that have family at the retreat, but for people in at large in the community who have someone they love who's suffering from addiction, um, that they could come for a, a four day residential immersion in the steps and spirituality of Al-Anon. And so that started around 2004. Uh, a little after that, we decided to create a, uh, a center for women's recovery. And we separated the men and the women. Uh, so today, and we just finished, uh, you know, taking uh, down one wing and building a $10 million national center for women's recovery on the property. So we have a 32-bed center for women's recovery, a 41-bed men's center, an 18-bed family program, and it also is a spiritual retreat center, and it's also an educational retreat center uh, on the campus. We also have non-residential programs, what typically are called outpatient programs. We, We don't call people patients here. They're guests. Um, so the non-residential happened in both here in Wyzetta and in St. Paul, uh, in an office on Grand Avenue. And that's an 18 week, twice a week for, for, uh, eight weeks. And then, uh, once a week for aftercare. And then we decided to start about seven years ago, uh, an older adult program, because obviously we were all watching the demographics not just in our own lives, but in everyone around us. What is it? uh, Somehow, uh, is it 19 million people are going to turn 65 every year for the next 19 years? Well, I know it's 1,000 a day. 1,000 a day. We'll turn 1,000 a day for 19 years. Baby boomers will turn 65. It's a lot of people. So it's a lot of people. And it's, uh, you know, when you start, when you're in that age group, some of the questions that you have are different than the questions you have when you're 35 years old and just trying to get off your mom's couch. You know, it's it's like now, you know, I, I ran a business. I raised a family. You know, I've been a complete success in my life. And now I'm retired and the phone doesn't ring and I'm suffering from an overwhelming sense of irrelevance. And now what do I do? Who am I? So I think that uh, there's a whole different set of questions that people 55 and over are asking about the next phase of their life. And so we created the Older Adult Program. It's it's a day program that's Monday, Wednesday from 9 till 3. And then we have Older Adult AA meetings every day at 10 o'clock where, you know, 35, 40 people pile in the building. uh, And it's this wisdom pool of of characters that come in and just are laughing and just so full of life. You know, they, they have a community now that they can share their life with and they can answer together the tough questions about who am I now that my wife has passed on and my business is gone and, and I'm living alone. And now it's like, you know, they're engaged in love and service. They're out there helping others. They're carrying the message. They're, 
They have a community of support around them. Now, this is I'm, I'm speaking about all of this, of course, pre-COVID. Everything has now uh, on the non-residential side and older adult side have moved to Zoom. Uh, just this, what I thought was going to be a, about a three-month Zoom experience has turned into probably, who knows, maybe first quarter of next year uh, before this is all over. But um, but anyway, it's... Uh, well, and that's, yeah, and that's ca- caused a lot of people to come up with a lot of creative solutions, but I think you've all done a really good job at that. And I, I thought maybe you could go over a little bit about um, what a typical day looks like. So if I were at the retreat, for instance, what would my day look like? Well, so you wake up at, uh, you know, seven in the morning, you have a continental breakfast and there's, there's muffins and juice and rolls and cereals and all that are set up for everyone to have breakfast and then they have meditation and uh the the guests go into their their the men's have a a meditation center for the men and the women have one for the women and they have different shifts every 20 minutes and it's a 20 minute silent meditation where they read out of their meditation books and then they sit in silence for 20 minutes and Really, that's to start the day with, you know, a grounding uh, that's spiritual in nature. And, you know, we're dealing with addicts that have a lot of chatter in their mind. And it's like, how do we quiet the chatter so that we can not be so reactive and start listening to these quiet messages that come from all different directions? Uh, So we start the morning off with meditation. Uh, then after that, uh, at, on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 8 a.m. to 10 o'clock, there's a big book study uh, where a presenter comes in and, and goes through uh, one section at a time, uh, covering the first 164 pages of the big book, which are the set of instruction part of the book. At 10 o'clock, then they, they have uh, half an hour of chore time. Uh, where they just, uh, everybody has a different chore, vacuuming the hallway or cleaning up the dining room or whatever. And then at 11 o'clock every day, there's a, a, a meeting we call chapel. It's it's not a religious thing, but we call it that because, well, Bill W. and Marty Mann called it that back in 1939. Uh, but it's really a, it's an hour long uh, meeting where, Someone comes in and talks about a spiritual principle related to recovery, surrender, forgiveness, compassion, whatever topic they want to talk about, but related to a spiritual principle. And then there's lunch at noon. Uh, And then at one o'clock, we have uh, different days of the week. They're different. Uh, Tuesday, there's a community meeting where all the staff and the guests get together and talk about how are things going? Any issues we need to talk about? Any concerns? Um, uh, and then we have some presenters, some other days where presenters come in and talk for a couple hours, giving a presentation on, you know, a particular topic related to recovery. Uh, teachers that come in and talk about trauma. They talk about what, how to find a sponsor. Uh, what's a good AA meeting look like? Uh, you know, different topics that are related to recovery. There's free time from 3 to 5.30. And at that time, they're working on their their paperwork that they're doing, not, not for any staff, but for themselves. They're not presenting it to the staff, uh, but they're, they're working on their materials and maybe preparing for their fifth step on their four-step work. And then dinner from 5.30 to 6.00 sometimes 6.30. And then every night of the week at 7, there's an AA meeting uh, that's brought in to the retreat. It's being Zoomed in now, but typically we have carloads of people from different AA clubs. We have 88 different AA and Al-Anon meetings that bring meetings out to the retreat every month. That's fantastic, John. I mean, it's really fantastic. And I mean, you know, as you describe this day, I love how practical it is, learning how to stay sober. What are the behaviors? What are the actions? And having people come in with great sobriety saying, you know, you know, you just, you can't help but look at them. They did it. 
So yeah. can I. It's fantastic. I mean, if, if you it's do really what great. I did, you'll get what I got. And and there right. and we've been blessed to have amazing people like yourselves coming in and presenting uh, to our guests. Uh, we've had, you know, singer songwriters from around the, the country and uh, all kinds of famous and infamous uh, people <laughs> and, and, and presenting messages. So, you know, they look at these people and they say, God, I, this is amazing. I want to be part of this life. I want to have this in my life. And that comes back to the attraction, which I think is so powerful at the retreat. That's the real key to the transformations that I have seen uh, in people that I have sent uh, t- through the program there. It's uh, really fantastic. Um, you know, I wanted to go back a little bit to um, the great transitional housing that you were talking about earlier that you have created. Can you talk a little bit about what that kind of transitional housing looks like at its best and the formula that you use to achieve a consistent level of quality while still keeping that housing affordable for people who are new in recovery? Yeah, that's a, it's a very good question. And it's uh, uh, affordability is always a challenge in the sober house world. Uh, uh, we've been very committed to keeping uh, our houses to a level that people can pay for them with what some would call sober jobs, where you have a job working at, you know, Ace Hardware or, or a bookstore or a coffee house or something that, you know, you're not, you're not going back to the big corporate job for a period of time in the very beginning. But, you know, the sober houses are a spiritual practice ground. Um, you know, you've learned so much about what recovery looks like. And you've also had the experience uh, of of feeling it and and having it surround you at the retreat in the residential program. Now you step out into the world. And we know from looking at research across the country, at treatment across the country, all the treatments, that the critical period of time after someone gets out of treatment is that three to eight week window. Most relapses happen in that three to eight week window of time. There's a spike that happens. And, you know, generally the, the first week or two, everybody's patting you on the back and you're, you're full of gratitude and you're kind of on the pink cloud. And, and then, you know, by the third week, the ego has reemerged and the old girlfriend or boyfriend starts showing up and the dealers start calling. And, and uh, before you know it, you're in trouble again. So the sober house is a way to surround yourself with 10, 11, 12 other men or women who can hold you accountable. They hold each other accountable to living on a higher spiritual principle. And to live in our sober houses, uh, you have to commit to one, of course, being sober, staying sober. You have to go to a minimum of four AA meetings a week. Uh, you have to have a sponsor and work closely with your sponsor. You have to do a service commitment once a week in the community. Uh, it could be bringing a meeting to detox or, you know, speaking at another treatment center or, or you know, doing a 12-step call with somebody. And you have to work full time. There are some who maybe they can go to school full time uh, instead of work. Uh, but for most of ours, it's it's getting a job and and uh, most people, you know, we tell people you have you have two weeks to get a full time job. And, you know, you think, God, how can that happen? Uh, well, it happens. Everybody does. Uh, on a rare occasion, there's somebody that takes a month to find a job because, well, the market's tight or, you know, we're in the middle of a covid epidemic. And and, and so we were a little more patient with them and try to hold their hand through that process. We do know that outcomes are better when people are working full-time and going to meetings. If they're just going to meetings and they have a lot of time on their hands throughout the day, uh, that gets to be a dangerous spot for people. So those are kind of the main elements. Uh, We have a house manager for each house, and then we have a a director that oversees our, our sober living continuum, and they 
they work with the house managers to come in and have, we have dinners with the guests of the residents there uh, once a week at each house to talk about, you know, how are things going? Who, who are we worried about? Uh, what are the challenges, the issues that you're dealing with? Uh, how can we help you, you know, to make the next right step here for moving on if you need to? Um, so, and our house managers are not live-in house managers. There are some sober houses that do have live-in house managers. But we have found that that the managers are better when they have their own full lives. And if you have a live-in house manager who stays three years sober and uh, they're living in the house with a bunch of sober guys, they can't really have a relationship. They can't really have a full life. And their whole life is consumed with with, uh, the the daily dramas of living in sober community. Uh, And and the quality of the houses begins to diminish with the quality of the manager's recovery. So uh, we like having managers that have full lives that are very active in, in every area of their life and also manage a house. And they come in and out of the house, you know, three, four times a week and more as necessary. If somebody comes in and, and they're concerned that they might've relapsed, the manager, uh, leaves their house and goes there immediately and helps assess the issue and deal with it. Um, But, uh, you know, the expectations are very simple, you know, that that, uh, you have to be in the game to live here. You've got to be willing and motivated to sit in the front row of recovery. And uh, this is not like, uh, you know, being a five and fiver where you go to the meeting five minutes late and leave five minutes early. We want you to be there early, set up the chairs, make the coffee, greet people at the door, and be active members of the recovery community. The thing that I've seen around the retreat, anytime going through it, talking to people that I've sent up there or being there uh, in person myself, if Deborah and I were doing a training or or just bringing a, pay, uh, a guest in, um, is the enthusiastic recovery that um, seems to pervade the place uh, or any one of the sober houses. It's really marvelous. I've brought so many people there over the years uh, who were feeling ambivalent, weren't sure that they could make it or not, and having all the usual doubts and confusion and so forth. Uh, But when I see them after they've been there a, a couple of weeks, they're just on top of the world. The uh, the tagline for the retreat is alive with the spirit of recovery. And I have to say, in my experience, it's really true. The retreat is alive with the spirit of recovery. And that's maybe the, the greatest compliment that I can give uh, the program and, and your, your lifetime work in uh, bringing it about. Well, thanks for saying that. I really appreciate that. And it, it, it's been a, a joy to be part of it. And uh, I'm just... Uh, I, I miss Dr. Mann every day. George was my spiritual partner in crime in this project, and, and uh, there was no one better to walk this path with than George. I, I will say, too, that by design, that same enthusiasm and connection to recovery happens with all of our staff. We're all front row members. We're all sober, active recovering people, in addition to being professionals, we're, we're very active in our own recovery. Our board of directors are all recovering people. So everywhere you look, from the kitchen, the maintenance, the, the program staff, the board of directors, you know, we're all in it. So, uh, and on any given day, any of these guests could be working the third step better than any one of us. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. I love the fact that you brought up George Mann, too, because he was certainly a great inspiration in my life as well. In fact, he uh, he actually challenged me uh, in a way to, to write uh, uh, Navigating Grace, my spiritual memoir, and I have such a, such a warm place in my heart uh, for him. He was uh, a, a, truly a spiritual giant. You know, we always loved our conversations with you and George and um, the thinking behind this program. And I'd just like to say, 
you know, it, this whole model of having this 12-step immersion program, but it is the way you execute it and what you do and the people you bring together. When you talk about community, we have witnessed that. And when Jeff talks about the people that, you know, professionally that we have, um, we have sent to the retreat, but I can't let this go by without saying we've also sent two of our own family members and both went through the retreat and both went um, to your sober house uh, housing, one a female who spent 10 months and a male who spent six months. So we know it intimately from a personal level in our own family as well. And, you know, in think in, 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 in that spirit, John, I really want to talk about the fact and I want people to understand this not just because of the retreat, but I think because of the philosophy of what you have created there. When you go to the retreat, it is also a beautiful place. I mean, the architecture of the buildings is phenomenal. You walk inside, everything is beautifully furnished. It's top, top, top. Sometimes when a treatment program has a low cost, it's a little ratty, you know, but not not at the retreat. It is beautiful. Every piece of furniture. And I really credit you largely with that because I know you really do have an eye for that. And then the campus as a whole and being surrounded by the old wood area. And also the fact that, you know, it just, they're trails to the woods. I'd just like you to talk about that a little bit and then also end and talk about how you've shared this model with other places in the United States and even internationally, because I think that generosity and how you help people replicate this is also such a part of your story. You know, I think the way the retreat looks and feels, I mean, it's kind of like when you go into a home that you're thinking of buying, you kind of know when you walk in the door that that's going to be your house. And, and so I think we were all very intentional about uh, looking at the flow of the building when somebody walks in for an admission. What do you want their families to feel when they arrive? What do you want the potential guests to feel when they walk in? And you want to feel like that, you know, the people who prepared the setting for them cared about them and believed that they were worthy of dignity. And, and you show that in, in the quality of the, the furnishings, the color, the, the look and feel of, of the buildings. You want it to be warm and attractive. And, you know, I've, uh, my, my architects always laugh at me because uh, every project I'm, I'm doing, I, they said, I, we know, John, you want first class, but you, know, you want it at the most reasonable dollar. <laughs> <laughs> and I go, yeah, I want first class. I want this place to look, I want it to be a wow when somebody walks in and feel like, you know, this, I could live in a place like this. And so every part of our program, we're very intentional about, you know, creating a, an environment that makes people feel worthy and good about themselves. And, you know, to be able to, you know, create a continuum of, of service like this for, you know, 30 days at the retreat for $5,400 for a month. compared to 40000 in most other places. And sober living for, you know, five seventy five. dollars uh, Our most expensive house, I think, is eight fifty. dollars So, uh, you know, trying to keep it in that, uh, you know, keep everything affordable. Family program, four-day residential experience for $495. Actually, the first... Uh, family member comes for free. It's built into the 5400, so it's it doesn't cost anything. And I am a little bit crazy and obsessed with uh, furnishings and color and the way things look. And I have a, I'm just enough OCD to straighten out all the chairs as I'm walking through the campus. And everybody kind of laughs at me about it, but you know that's okay. It's no, John. Great. I want to say it makes it a makes- difference. I mean, I'm a little. Jeff will tell you I'm a little bit like that too. <laughs> And it makes a huge difference. The feeling there is just, it makes you, at least for me, when I'm there, I want to live there. It really is so beautiful. It really is That beautiful. attention to detail and having the chairs straightened out and everything, it's calming. You know, when things get chaotic looking, it's not calming. Yeah. 
So where has the retreat been replicated? Talk to us a little bit about how you've shared the model. Well, that was the other thing is that, you know, George and I always felt like we, we need to, we, we're trying to create a, a beta site in many ways to let the world know that you can help more people for less money and keep it quality and spiritual and dignified and, and uh, still meet all the, the, the proper thresholds that, uh, that professionally we want to make sure we meet. And, uh, you know, so our idea was to let's create something that shines bright enough that other people would want to replicate this. Uh, now, there was talk early on that, you know, maybe the retreat would open something that we would expand and grow. And, and you know, having kind of grown up in the Hazelden world, which, by the way, was one of the great experiences of my life growing up professionally in Hazelden. Uh, but I was part of that whole growth experience, you know, to where we had 500 residential beds all around the country. And, you know, there's a weight that happens organizationally when you start owning and operating centers around the country that starts to distract you in some ways. And, and so we wanted to be careful not to grow ourselves out of specialness. And yet we wanted to help others plant the same seed in their communities. So it started with a a group in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, that somebody came by and wanted to, he'd heard about the retreat. He wanted to come visit. And so we brought him in and we asked if we'd help him set up a sober house in Sioux Falls. And I wrote a business plan for him and he found a house and set it up and Uh, You know, a few months later, he said, well, now we want to create the entire continuum. And so we wrote a bigger business plan and showed them how to do that and brought them in and brought their staff in to teach them how to do it. And they created tall grass in Sioux Falls, South Dakota and uh, modeled after the retreat. And then uh, another physician in Hong Kong wanted to create a retreat model on a 110 foot boat in the Aberdeen Harbor called Recovery Works, and he opened that, and that ran for about 12 years. And So we now have 12 locations that we've helped start, and basically we write their business plan, we help train their board and their staff, and show them how to do it, let them go. And then they, you know, and they, they continue to work with us, you know, as a consultant, and we do it mostly for free and for fun. Uh, and so we've helped create hundreds of beds around the world. We've got uh, retreat model programs in Waterford, Ireland, and Wexford, Ireland. Uh, two in Nashville, Tennessee, called Stillwaters that we helped uh, set up for Cumberland Heights. Uh, we helped set up Gate Lodge for the Hanley family in Florida. Uh, there's a place in Colorado and one in Texas and Portland, Oregon, and And then there are two that use our name. And when they use our name, then we have, uh, you know, some more constraints and and make sure that, you know, we've worked hard on our brand. We don't want to just give it to anybody. Uh, So the retreat in Auckland, New Zealand has been open for five years. And, uh, And the retreat in Sydney, Australia, and the people that are involved in both Auckland and Sydney are just amazing professionals. They've been in the treatment field for 30, 40 years and, and very active in recovery. And, and I mean, they are the, the right people to make a model like this work. Uh, so, you know, it's been really exciting to, to watch these seeds develop and grow. And, uh, and we've, been able to help them learn from our experience and, and hope they don't repeat the same mistakes that we made. And, and, uh, and yet we all do. And, and we learn from each other. And then we have conference calls. And like this uh, next week, we have another Zoom meeting with the Auckland and Sydney group and all our staff and all their staff get together on a big Zoom call. And we talk for two hours about everything, just about how do you do this? And how does this work? And who should be sent here and there. And so it's, it's a, you know, it's a lot of fun, actually. We enjoy helping others do it and hopefully we're making a difference out in the world. 
Well, I know you are. There's no doubt about it. It's uh, it's wonderful work, and I'm just uh, I'm so happy and so grateful for everything that you've done. Uh, it's really marvelous what the uh, you and George Mann and the community of recovering people. Who knew it would ever get to be uh, a worldwide uh, movement? Uh, it really is, even though it may be a little modest. It's just incredible to think about across the Atlantic, across the Pacific, and really uh, taking root and helping people all around the world. And you know, the thing about it is, John, is I really think that it was the coming together of you and George Mann that you both brought a skill set to this, a vision, your time at Hazelden, most certainly. Uh, George Mann uh, leaving his practice as an anesthesiologist, correct? Yeah. To move into the recovery world in his work at St. Mary. And of course, he worked with Vern Johnson, the father of intervention. Um, so you came with an amazing skill set as well as your aesthetic eye for beauty. And you were able to create something really wonderful. And I've met some of your board members and certainly your staff. I know many of them well. And you've, you've done something amazing here. But I want to end with one thought. I was sitting in your office a couple years ago and we were talking because, of course, there's great treatment in this country and there are many, many people that need that level of care. So we want to be careful that people understand that. But you said to me, what about the every day man. What about the everyday man that cannot afford it? And you've created something fantastic that's incredibly affordable. And there's great genius behind that. So thank you for doing that. Well, thanks for saying that, Deborah. And it's it's our friendship, both yours and Jeff's and, and George. I, I know we all, George and I so much look forward to those times we had together sitting out on the porch and, and, you know, spending all day just talking about life and the world. And uh, it's just uh, been an amazing friendship, both of you. So thank you for that. Well, it's something we cherish. And um, we wanted to talk about this model because we think it's so important. And of course, we also want people to know that if they're interested in learning more about it, they can go to theretreat.org. Yep. Just theretreat.org or call the, the, and well, they can find the number on there as well. So Sounds great. Thank you so much for joining us for the Best Minds podcast. We've been really looking forward to this, John. Thank you. Yes, thank you for joining us today. It's really been great. My pleasure. Thank you. This has been the Best Minds Podcast. See you next time.